Okay, Jiva. You said we were going to come back and talk about functions. Yes. Um, so I guess start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. It is. It is. So earlier I talked about when we were talking about pointers, <clears throat> I was talking about how it's kind of difficult, I think, for people to think about multiple things at once. And to me, I think a lot of programming technologies kind of come down to um, abstracting that whole idea. You know, the idea that that um, it's difficult for me to look at a whole bunch of stuff and um, and comprehend it all. It's much easier if I can just sort of package things up and kind of label them and set them aside and know just by by naming something that you know that's what that thing does. So a lot of programming concepts come down to that same kind of um, abstraction, whether it's um, procedures, which is what we're going to talk about here, or object-oriented programming, or, or, or even design patterns, those kinds of things. It all kind of boils down to that same kind of idea that you want to kind of package something up, name it, and stow it away somewhere so you don't have to think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the same idea behind the concept that we're going to talk about now, which is functions. Um, in, you know, Objective-C is, of course, a fully object-oriented language. Um, so it has all of the technologies necessary in order to do object-oriented programming. But it also has, from its C background, it has um, lots of capabilities in terms of being a procedural programming language as well. When you talk about a procedural programming language, that means basically that you can break up parts of your application into procedures and, again, stow them away, name them, um, specify the interface to that procedure, say, you know, this is the, these are the parameters that pr that procedure needs, and this is the value type that it returns, and then you can pass stuff to it and have it return something to you. So that's really where this whole idea of functions or procedures comes from. And a lot of people use these terms interchangeably, whether it's functions or procedures. Um, technically, Objective-C is a procedural language. There is such a concept as a functional language. But often, you know, so in other words, the, the things that you're dealing with here are actually procedures. But, the, um, but most of the time, people will refer to them as functions as well. So let's take a look at uh, kind of an example yeah. for, for, what I, for what I'm talking about here. So this is an example application that actually uh, calculates a factorial value for five, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't let you pass anything special in. It's just got um, A set to a value of five, <clears throat> and um, you, it just calculates the factorial of five, which will be 120. Okay. So if we ran this right now, it would it would essentially print out 120, which is exactly what it does. Now, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually like break out that calculating of the factorial, which is essentially just limited to this chunk of code right here, this uh, this for loop, where it's in order to calculate the fa factorial, right? <clears throat> you take uh, you you take all of the numbers up to whatever number you're, you're calculating the factorial of, and you multiply that number, the, the result, by that number. So, right, okay, yeah. so we'll do 5 times 1, 5 times 2, 5 times 3, and we just keep adding those values in there. And that's how mm -hmm. we ultimately get to 120. So <clears throat> in order to... So wouldn't it be cool if we could take that little chunk of code, pull it out, and reuse it for calculating the factorial for other numbers besides just 5? So to do that... What we could do is we could take that and and do exactly that. We can pull it out into a function, which is what we've done here. So here we've actually defined a calculate factorial function okay. or procedure. And what we do is we define the interface here. That's what this line here is. We're, we're setting the interface for this function right here. And we're specifying that it'll be called calculate factorial. That's what this name is here. Uh, you specify the parameters. Those are the the variables that are passed to the function. Mm -hmm. Those are specified after the name in parentheses. And just like defining variables in your in your um, regular code, you have to specify the type and the variable name. Now that variable will be available within 
the scope of your function. Okay. Then you also specify on the other side of the name, you specify the return type. You don't have to re specify the return variable name because the calling code will be specifying the variable name. Okay. You're just saying this is what this function will return. Right. So, in other words, when you go to use this function, you'll actually say calculate factorial and you'll pass in whatever number you want to calculate and you'll assign the result of this function to another variable. Right. Yep. Um, now, interestingly enough, if you look at this, this is actually the exact same syntax that we used when we were defining our main function. And in fact, yes, the main function, like we said before, is just a function. Just a normal function. It takes arguments, it takes the, you know, the argument count, which is the argc, it takes the argument list, which is an array of um, string pointers, and it returns an integer value to determine whether, or to, to, to um, allow you to give a result of whether or not the program completed successfully. So that's, it's just like a regular function. Um, now, once you've got, once you've defined the interface for that function, then you define the scope of the function, just like we've talked about before with the curly braces. So here are the here is the scope of that act, of that function right there, and then all of the code for that function is put inside of those curly braces. And again, going back to our calculate factorial, essentially we are just getting a result value here that we're going to set initially to one, mm -hmm. and then we loop over the, um, we, we basically count up to the value that's passed in, and we multiply the numbers times the result, and then finally we return the result. Now this is an important part of the function here, this return concept, right? Again, you know, we've specified here as part of the interface that this function will return, in this particular case, a long integer. Right, yeah. Which is basically we're saying it's going to return a big number, um, which is logical because, well, when you're calculating factorials, numbers get really big really fast. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the so in this particular case, so the calculate factorial function will return a long integer, and in order to actually return that value to the calling function um, or to the calling stack, uh, we use this special return statement. And that basically just takes, you say, return, and then whatever value you want to return there. Now, you can have multiple return statements in a function, but the function will exit when the return statement is hit. Right, okay. So, That's in other words, right, if I, if I just came up here, if I just came here and put return result right there, then it would only actually execute this loop once. It would hit that return statement and return right there without actually calculating anything more than the factorial of one. Which wouldn't be very useful. That would not be very useful no. at all. So once you have this function defined, like we've done here, then you can call that function from other places in your program. So if we go down here and we look at this main function, <clears throat> the, uh, here's where we're actually calling the calculate factorial function. So again, you know, we're still doing this a equals five. So at this point we have a variable, it's called a, and we're going to call the calculate factorial function and pass a as a parameter. Right, okay. And then we're going to get the result of that function and we're going to store it in the result variable here, which is a long int. Which is good because our function is returning a long int. Exactly. So that makes a bit of sense. Exactly. And then we're going to print out that result. So if we run this, essentially it's going to do exactly the same thing that our previous function did. It's going to print 120, which is exactly what it did. Which is just done. So that's kind of cool. You know, you're, you're able to do the, that, those things. Um, but really, you know, the reason we did this was so that we could reuse that code, right? So we could call that function multiple times for different values, which is what this new example does. So again, we still have this calculate factorial function here. You know, it's doing its thing. It's returning the factorial for a number. But now we're actually passing, we're actually calling it multiple times. We first call it for 5, then we call it for 10, then we call it for 15, then we call it for 20. Right. This is going to 
grow very quickly. And you know, if you wanted to experiment with this code and put in larger numbers in there, I think you'll quickly find that you'll you'll uh, overflow the size even of a long end. Yeah. But nonetheless, um, and not to mention the fact that <clears throat> calculating the factorial actually takes a little bit of time, so uh, it, it it will tend to get slow. But in any case. Um, the important thing to know here is that you know we're reusing that code, and we didn't have to rewrite it. We didn't have to clutter our main function with piles and piles and piles of this, right? If we had wanted to do this without a function, then we'd wind up having, you know, just reams of code in this main function where we're only changing one value, the value that we are trying to calculate factorial on, right? So if we run this code here then we should see that it will actually print out the factorial for each one of these these um, numbers here. Here's hoping. Yeah, that's actually... There we go. So as you can Good. see, you know, the factorial for 20 is... Big. Pretty hefty. <laughs> We're not even going to try and read that number. That's right. It's a, it's, it's a big fat number. Um, so anyway... <clears throat> So again, you know, um, now another thing, another interesting thing that we um, that we did here is we also removed that kind of intermediate stage of defining that number that we were going to calculate the factorial on. You know, if we go back and we look at if we go back and we look at at, uh, at the other code where we were saying, you know, we were setting a to five and so forth, we could have done um, a to to uh, 5, to 10, to 15, to 20, but instead we just pass the number as the parameter. Now the interesting thing, the, the, reason that, the reason that's kind of interesting is just sort of to make the point that just because a function takes a variable as an argument doesn't mean you have to pass a variable. You can pass a value and the value will actually get assigned to the parameter of the function as it's passed in. That's uh, worth knowing, right? So that's exactly what we're what we're what's happening here. So, <clears throat> calculate factorial five assigns the value of five to value in the cal in the calculate factorial function, and then the value inside of cal calculate factorial um, is again available inside of that scope, and we can calculate it from there. And because we never need that value anywhere else, we don't need a variable to hold it. Really, exactly, exactly. Okay. Same thing goes for the result. <clears throat> the result, um, again, we could have assigned that result to another variable and then printed out the result. But instead, we're actually just using it right here to print it right um, onto the screen. So it's going straight into the nslog function. Right. And getting handled. <clears throat> so as far as the types of things that you can specify when you're creating the function interface, um, you, you can use all kinds of um, all the same kinds of variable types and variable names and so forth that you use when you're defining variables inside of your uh, of your other code, right? Um, <clears throat> you can also specify multiple parameters by separating those parameters with a comma. Okay. So in this particular case, um, you know, this is just a, a simple example where we're passing two different functions here. The first one is called a, and it's an integer, and then the second one here is actually a pointer to an integer called oh, b. Oh, you're making it complicated now. So two parameters, one's an integer, one's a pointer to an integer. Exactly. Now it could have been, you know, b could have been just another integer if you wanted to, but you mix now. There's some there's some things to 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 see here in, in addition to that. Um, so that's the first thing. Another interesting thing to uh, keep in mind, so the return value can also be any of those same variable types. You know, it can be integers, doubles, floats, pointers, and so forth. There's also a special um, type of function called a void. And void basically means it doesn't return anything. Right, okay. So in this particular case, in, in the case of this function here, in fact, actually, this code will actually assign a value to b, and it will actually essentially return that result inside of b. So it's not actually returning anything as a return value, it's actually changing the original value to b by using pointers. But okay, this is where I, I think we need some explanation then, because your function there, my function, is changing a, and it's changing b, 
But you're only telling me that we're going to see the change in B. Yes. Why is that? Well, so when you pass variables to a function, the default is to do what's called pass by or to pass by copy. So in other words, it, it copies the variable for the function. Right. So if I just do a normal thing like this, where I've got this A and I'm passing it in there, um, <clears throat> and then I assign a value to it, I'm actually assigning a value to the copy of A that was passed to my function. I'm not actually assigning a value to the original A down here in my um, where I'm calling the function. Right. So it's copying that value, and any changes that I make to it are only actually changed inside the scope of my function itself. Because after that function finishes, our copy of A, that parameter, goes out of scope, disappears. Correct. Correct. Uh, and the original A is never changed. Okay. Now, if I have a case where I want to change a parameter that's passed in, now truthfully, the best thing to do is to return results from a return value. Yeah. Not to necessarily use, these are called mutating parameters. In other words, I pass in a parameter, and then by virtue of me passing it in there, it gets changed to something else. Yeah, but that's not always obvious, is it? That doesn't always make it readable or right, usable. Right, right. It can be confusing. It, it's, it's sort of programming by side effect, which is okay. not really a great practice. No. Um, <clears throat> so, on the other hand, however, there's cases where it's really necessary. So, for example, let's imagine that you have um, a function that returns some value, let's say true or false, determine, to determine whether or not it's, it was successful in doing whatever it needed to do. And if it returns false, then you want some way of getting out of that function an error message that, that tells you what actually went wrong, hmm. right? So in that case, you might create this function so that it would be like a bool here. Um, and then the uh, and then maybe you would have like a string or something that you would pass in as a parameter that is passed in as a pointer. Now when you do that, because it's a pointer, remember you're accessing the original thing that it was pointing at. So even in this function, that pointer still references the original thing back in the caller. Because, okay, let me make sure I get this. Okay, B is still a copied variable. Right. Okay, but what is being copied is the address... Exactly, the address. ...of the data that B is referring to. Yes. So when we dereference B, if I get the terminology correct, by putting the, uh, the dereference symbol next to it, yep. there, it, it points to the same data is our original copy of B. Correct. So it's actually pointing to this B down here. So if we change that data, both Bs effectively are being changed. Precisely. Because they are looking at the same data. Which is exactly what's happening here. So in the body of our function here, we dereference B, assign, the, assign 20 to that dereferenced memory location, which actually comes down here and assigns it to that guy down there. Well, technically, I mean, it's doing the assignment here. So. If we actually run this program, then we'll actually see that B printed out here will be set to 20, whereas it was originally set to 10. Whereas A would have stayed at 10. And, and A would stay at 10. Now, I guess this is important to understand then that if we pass, and I know we haven't got there yet, but if we pass an object mm -hmm. to a function, because an object variable was just a pointer, we will be changing the original object. Yes. There's a couple of little caveats there in that you can't necessarily dereference an object pointer and change the object itself. In other words, in other words, I couldn't like assign to an object pointer through that pointer and change the object that it was assigned to. But it's still the same object and it will be automatically dereferenced. And if I use any of the methods on that object, indirectly through there, it'll get, it'll change the original object. And so any changes, if I assign, if I, if I use methods on that object to make changes to the object's data, that will change the data in the original object. I think I jumped ahead of ourselves there, because we haven't even spoken about objects yet, and now we're talking about methods on objects, so uh, just a taster of what's coming. Yeah. We'll get to there later on. Okay.
So this is sort of the, the gist of, of how you define functions and things. You know, the important things to understand are that you have um, the interface to the function here, right? You have the function body. Um, you do, if you return a value, then you need to have the, you know, return statement, you know, true or yes, uh, for example, okay? Um, and that will return from your function wherever that statement is. Um, and then, uh, that of course you can have, so, so in other words, you can have multiple return statements and that you can reuse chunks of code by doing this, by using these functions in this way. That's really cool. Now, I'm making a guess that some people have just been copying this at their computer, but they put the, my function beneath the main function and have just discovered something. Yes. And um, I guess that uh, when we come back, we'll look at all that stuff and why that's the case of what they've just discovered. Yes. And now if they weren't doing that, they are trying that to see what the others just discovered. Indeed. So once you've discovered it, we'll come back.